So uh, we're going to then transition um, to uh, the uh, to the projects uh, that we the, some of the research that we've been developing in relationship to the uh, these questions uh, in the program. Um, as I said, what you're going to see here are uh, directions of research uh, in progress, not solutions. Uh, something more like uh, alphabets uh, than grammars. Um, they represent Kind of dense summaries of longer conversations that we feel have reached a point where they could be looked back upon uh, as having gotten perhaps somewhere. Um, they represent all of the uh, conflicts and contradictions uh, that collaborative work uh, always uh, always bring, brings with it. Um, and it, after we will go through, we will present um, uh, two of these projects, governing simulations and artificial anthropos, at which point in time we'll then open up the, uh, we'll have the Nikolai Vojev, who's one of our, our faculty, um, will have picked some of the questions that have been, that are popping up in the chat window. Um, so if you have questions of anything that you've seen so far and also after these projects, uh, now is the time to prepare them and to populate those windows and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I should say that some that we uh, the 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 research that you've seen uh, the, the uh, has, was done also in collaboration with a number of other Strelka faculty, uh, Nikolai Boyjev and Lisa Dur, who are um, core faculty in our program, as well as Robert Petrushko, uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and Jeff Mena, who you'll hear from a little bit later uh, today, has been part of this conversation. Each of these presentations is about five minutes long. Um, we will present two, and then we will have this. Q&A. So first, let me quickly introduce the first one, uh, governing simulations. Um, we are at this moment, one where uh, one of the other ways in which we may think of this moment is one in which the news comes at us in forms of graphs and diagrams uh, of projections of what is likely to happen as much as it does of prose. Uh, and so perhaps uh, in addition to uh, uh, in artistic literacy, mathematical literacy uh, as a human right, uh, becomes a clearer proposition now, uh, as do, uh, which does not, of course, prevent the uh, egregious or comical abuse um, of these uh, graphs and diagrams for those for whom a quantified reality, be that climate change or artificial intelligence, is an inconvenient menace. But uh, models are only as good as the inputs and incompetent governments have learned to cook the books in a way by keeping the numbers low by not testing. Uh, what testing is, what Daniel uh, called the, the sensing layer of, of, of the epidemiological mode of, of the social. Without tests, models are guesswork. Um, but we don't necessarily see them this way. The unfortunate dichotomy uh, perhaps rules, one where smart city infomercials have taught us to think of sensors as some kind of exotic chip, uh, whereas social democratic politics to think of testing as, a, as think of this, the think of public health in terms of non-technological therapeutic care, um, which um, Daniel's remarks also spoke to. Each misses a significant part of the picture. In many ways, testing and sensing are the same thing. More testing allow, it allows for better sensing, which allows for better models, which means better public health response. This is, in fact, arguably what the sensors are for. Um, inadequate planning and provision for testing is inadequate modeling, which is inadequate governance. Uh, cities that have passed this test are the ones that have flattened the curve effectively. Cities that have failed the sensing layer test are turning public meeting halls into makeshift morgues, a kind of touching we could do without. Um, this group, Governing Simulations, the first we'll hear from today, has taken that thread um, and imagined it into in a kind of extreme, where decisions of literal life or death are weighed based on comprehensive factors in various ratios, even including cost. So whether it's the Italian doctors who wrote protocols for which patients should get scarce ventilators, or governments weighing the likely misery of opening or closing an economy, triage in some sense may be unavoidable. Um, and it does not always mean siding with death. These decisions, in other words, are not necessarily optional. Uh, and in principle should be taken based on, uh, not on improvisational caprice, uh, but on the socially derived ethical framework 
which is to say a standardized set of criteria. So this group uh, begins and departs from uh, Foucault's biopower, Kelia Membe's necropolitics, also an EGS faculty, and arrived at a rather different place. Um, they do so by going to the cold heart of what we, what they call necroeconomics. So with that, let me pass it to the first group on governing simulations. Yes, hello, uh, I'm Andrei. I'm currently in Moscow. I'm from group governing simulations. Hi, I'm Gong. I'm currently in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm from this group as well. Uh, hi, my name is Zhenya, uh, and uh, I'm currently in Moscow. Yeah, hi, and uh, I'm Brian, uh, the fourth member of, of this group. And um, uh, yeah, we're go governing simulations. So I will start my, uh, or our rather, presentation now. Uh, all right, so yeah, we're, we're governing simulations. Um, and we're going to give a little bit of an, uh, an intro to necroeconomics. So a lot of the world events of the 21st century are sort of characterized and internalized by this question of where were you? Um, where were you when the planes hit? Where were you when the markets crashed? And we mean the last time, not this current time as it's happening right now. Um, where were you when he got elected? And with COVID-19, this question is once again applicable, except there is no universal single moment to refer to. The where is as personal as the when. And so when did you realize or when did you take the pandemic seriously? Um, your answer probably has something to do with your proximity to death, whether a personal loss or a mass fatality in the country you're from or that you're in, this is probably what that decided. And so the absolute death count, um, while it made it personally uh, real, it is also what um, governments were simulating to, to get a better understanding. And we could see that when the Imperial College report in their uh, worst case scenario where nothing would be done, uh, predicted that there could be anywhere from two to four million fatalities in the US alone, that some parts of the US finally went into lockdown. But it was uh, only a week later or two weeks later that we saw that there was another way of looking at death other than the absolute death count that was being looked at. And it was this idea of sort of economy over fatality. Um, and these deadly economics or, or necroeconomics are, are nothing new, despite us being often um, insulated from it uh, or simply because we don't really want to face it. Um, but if we are to reconsider these systems that sort of, you know, help us survive, um, we, we want to get familiar with them. And so what better place to start than to look at our current crisis through the lens of one of the most widely used models, which is called the value of a statistical life. And uh, through the eyes of this model, um, they might put a value on the current amount of deaths of COVID-19 uh, at $1.28 trillion. And I'll switch real quick to uh, give a little preview of this website that will uh, launch soon, where the uh, latest death count is converted to uh, a dollar amount which is at this, at this point, uh, the latest count is 190,000. Um, and the model, the, the model that we use converts that to $1.28 trillion. Um, you'll also be able to see what the individual value of a statistical life is per country. So right now it says here for Russia at $1.9 million, um, and you'll be able to, to explore the different countries. Um, so let's go back to the presentation and talk a little bit um, more about this. So first of all, the, the currency of the dollar. Um, perhaps the question is what better currency to, to express this in, seeing as the dollar is the only currency uh, used for the anaerobic decomposition of buried dead organisms, better known as oil. Um, every country that um, trades in oil uh, takes this in dollars, not in their own currency, hence uh, some of them perhaps being a bit nervous right now. Um, but this isn't the only reason to express this in dollars. It's also because the paper that we um, used for this um, also uh, established the value of a statistical life or VSL um, in dollars. But let's take a little bit step uh, a step back. What is VSL? Um, basically in the 1960s, an economist called Thomas Schelling uh, found a way to put a price on life that sort of circumvented the usual political and moral fall traps uh, that this obviously and expectedly uh, had on it. So um, he focused instead on risk. So let's take, for example, um, a air pollution policy. 
And let's say on an individual level, this costs you $3 um, for a reduced risk of 0.0002%. Now, in a town or in a city of 1 million people, this could be aggregated up and reveal that the cost of $3 million could save two lives. And these are, of course, two statistical lives. And so this Thomas Schelling took this to say, okay, here we can see a value of a statistical life. By taking the willingness to pay that $3 divided by the risk reduced, we get a value of a statistical life of a million and a half dollars. And since, uh, since then, this model is widely used for different uh, contexts and different scenarios. Um, the White House used it to put a price on the opioid epidemic um, at four, $504 billion. Um, it's used by the World Bank, by the Environment Protection Agency. Uh, it was used in the 70s by Ford to lobby against fuel tank regulations. Uh, and there are many more uh, examples. So when it is said by the governor of New York that we are not going to put a dollar figure on human life, this is technically correct. Uh, there is never a dollar figure put on any individual human life, but statistical lives are a different story. And uh, this has been a different story all the way back since the Great Plague, when uh, another economist, William Petty, um, calculated that the, at the time, thought to be 68,000 lives um, were worth about 7 million pounds. And this was done um, by using the GDP uh, which he was one of the first ones to use, although the term wasn't invented yet at the time. And so this was fully based on human capital or labor value, which of course doesn't give a full picture of a, of a life's worth. Now the value of statistical life um, gives a, a better picture as it uses um, a wide variety of these sort of revealed preferences of, of risk, um, but also direct uh, surveys to be able to establish something like a population average. Um, the problem is that not all countries have these surveys. And so this paper from Cambridge from 2017 that we, uh, we use as a reference um, takes a widely accepted baseline VSL of the United States at $9.6 million and uses this to calculate the value of a statistical life for 189 countries. And so um, this gives you a wide variety across different countries. Now, of course, these are population averages. This um, results in a, in a high estimate um, because it doesn't take into account age or occupation, for example. And not that taking age into account um, always goes without controversy, which uh, goes for the VSL model itself as well. Um, as was referenced before, we can see that right now um, with triage. Um, you know, it's, ha it's happened and had to, had to happen in a lot of places. In Italy, um, you know, triage is used, in general, triage is used to give help to that person who can, uh, has the most chance of survival. And so in Italy, that means that the younger get preference usually over the older. Um, it has also been said that this would not fly in the United States. Um, and this is true, especially when we look at a example from Value of a Statistical Life, where uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in 2003 tried to adjust it um, for uh, senior citizens. And this became known as the senior death discount. Um, and it was an outcry and they eventually had to retreat. This time, the uh, Civil Rights Office uh, didn't let it come to an outcry and they basically um, posited that hospitals couldn't discriminate based on age um, or disability for that matter as well. And so it became uh, about pre-existing conditions, which basically just pla places the discriminatory factor further upstream and reveals the already existing systemic problems. Um, as pre-existing conditions, uh, are more present in those of low income and of people of color who can't afford health care. And so um, uh, what you see happening in the States is that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting those groups. Um, and so what we see is that COVID-19 is much less the great equalizer and in fact much more uh, perhaps the great emphasizer, uh, emphasizing what has always already been there um, including the necroeconomics uh, and the models um, that are behind them. Uh, and so we would like to invite you to uh, keep an eye out for our essay in which we will um, expand on, on some of these examples on the model of value of a statistical life and on the necroeconomics and, and where they might go if we, um, if we are to face the, the happening ecological crisis. Um, this will take place at strelkamag.com. Uh, and the COVID-19 death value will eventually launch at deathvalue.fyi. Um, so this was a, an introduction to the introduction to necroeconomics. Um, thank you guys very much.
Thank you, Brian.